Good morning. Welcome to this Facebook Live broadcast from the Shawnee Centre in Worthing. We're here with the Worthing and Ada Chamber of Commerce, who've organised a special debate about Brexit and what happens next since Britain voted to leave the European Union. A little later on, we're going to be joined by Worthing's MPs, Tim Lawton, who's the MP for East Worthing and Shoreham, and Sir Peter Bottomley, who's MP for Worthing. Uh, they'll be joining us later on for a debate, and we'll be asking them some questions. But I'm first joined by Julian Choffrey, who's the Vice President of Worthing and Ada Chamber of Commerce, uh, just to talk about why we're here and what this is really all about. So, Julian, good morning. Good morning. And why has the Chamber decided to put on this event? Well, the Chamber was involved in May with a pre-Brexit event, again with our MPs, and there was a lot of interest in that. We've done a survey of our members, and our membership is very diverse, from international exporters to homeland businesses. And the response to that survey has been quite phenomenal. It seems to us there's a lot of unsettlement out there. People don't know quite where things are going. So what we're really doing at the moment is taking the pulse of where we're at with Brexit and hoping to inform the debate as to where we want it to be going. Does the Chamber as such have a, have a view about whether Brexit was a good idea and whether we've got problems lying ahead, or are, you, are, are the Chamber very confident? Well, I don't think the Chamber has a political view at all, and I think the, the view coming from its membership is diverse because that reflects the membership itself. I think in the May meeting, the general consensus was that we should remain, and uh, we did a show of hands, and that, that looked like, and I think generally people thought that was going to be the outcome of the vote. And then the vote obviously didn't go that way, and businesses had to then take stock. What business needs and what we're hoping to get out of this sort of debate going forward, and information coming down from the government, is a degree of certainty so that the government knows where it's going, and we know where we're going to be placed in all of that. So you've got the MPs coming this morning. We uh, have. Sir Peter Bottomley and Tim yes, Morton. Yes. Um, are they supportive of the Chamber and of business in Worthing generally? They're great. Absolutely great. Regardless of your politics, you can take nothing away from them. They're here at meetings like this. They were here in May. They're busy in their political lives. But they're behind business through, through everything that we have to go through. They're there with us informing and guiding where they can. It's difficult for them events like this because only last night or early this morning, Theresa May wasn't giving anything away. All she was saying to the European ministers was, well, we're in it until we're out. Now, what that means, nobody knows. What certainly, from a business perspective, what we want and what we need to know is the direction we're going in. We need to have that certainty. And we've got to put the things in place now to get it. What are you hoping for out of this morning's debate? What am I hoping for? I'm hoping that we will start to get some reassurances to where we're going, certainly from the MPs here. I'm hoping that they will give some feedback on the questions that are coming from the floor. They're good questions. They're really seeking some reassurance, some confidence, because that's what we need. As a country now, we are where we are. We're all in Brexit, whether we voted for it or not. And now we've got to move forward together to make sure that Grand GB actually works and we can face up to the challenges of today. Okay, we look forward to the debate. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Join us a little bit later on when we'll be talking to the MPs themselves and also covering the debate here at the Shawmandeen Centre.
six models I've identified briefly, the World Trade Organization, which we've heard of, the European Economic Area, that's the Norway model, the Customs Union, which seems to be a model that Turkey works on, the Swiss model, and the model that came out of our relationship with um, Canada, uh, that one itself took about seven years to formulate and the perceived wisdom of this that we were heading in a similar, it could take at least as long. What, um, what we, I'm also going to be looking at now is what's what we term the new association agreement uh, that hopefully uh, I'll be talking to us a little bit about as Theresa May has now indicated that we're looking at something quite bespoke. So without further ado, um, what I would ask our MPs to probably as an open and say where they think we are now. I'm personally interested to know whether they have confidence in the team that are going to lead us forward. A lot of um, comments have been made about uh, Boris and his positions for the um, Foreign Secretary and whether he's the right man for the job, given what he said a couple of days pre-Brexit and uh, how we then led. And um, I wonder if we've got another one. Have we got another one? Yeah, Delighted to be here on the 63rd birthday of Peter Mandelson, who was once one of our European commissioners, and on the 162nd birthday of Oscar Wilde, who you may remember in the importance of being honest, said when he's in deep trouble, he'll refuse everything except food and drink. So, can I, on behalf of Tim and myself, thank you for the breakfast, the <laughs> coffee, and for the orange juice? The greatest certainties will come after two and possibly three elections. One is the French election. Don't expect the French to do anything significant until they've had their election. And secondly, the German elections. Don't expect anything significant to come until Germany's got itself on a way forward, not a deadlock. Although the curiosity about Germany is they've got a grand alliance at the moment. So don't expect any great change there, because whoever's going to win is either going to be each of the social democrats and social democrats going on together, or one of them going on with some other partners, there won't be a great deal of change. The possible third election is whether the Labour MPs decide to trigger an election in this country. Uh, we don't have a fixed five year parliament, but there are ways of getting around that, and that is in the hands of minority parties. You can expect, whether that won't be said by anybody, the Conservatives will be happy to go to general election any time anybody wants to have one. So each of us will have our vote well taken with, with Theresa May, with Boris Johnson, probably with Philip Hammond as well, and you'd be ready for something possibly to happen. I don't predict it, but those are the political issues. My answer or approach to the question put about which of the six approaches might come is not association at all, but cooperation. And the difference in effect between the EU and Europe, as a play on words, is the word rope. And the question is whether that rope that joins EU and Europe is between us, separating us, or between us joining us in cooperation. And I think the message which ought to come out from the Chamber, from the Members of Parliament, to governments, these governments who are doing the negotiations and discussions, 
is try to make sure that the cooperation exists, and that in effect should be to get the effect of customs union, free trade, whatever it's called. So I won't go into the, the words. Politicians and negotiators always deal with the words. The question is what effect you're trying to achieve. No one can tell you, probably for about six or nine months, what the long-term student's arrangement is going to be. And by the way, the student's arrangements go all the way from the postdocs at the Crick Institute at King's Cross to the person coming in for a six-week language course. And in between, you have the normal people doing masters, people coming from undergraduate degrees, or for other qualifications. And people just don't know. People will be asked for what they believe to be their own interest, and some will have to judge what's in the national interest. But there'll be uncertainty. In fact, in fact uncertainty is going to continue. Should be nothing new. Just consider what we've managed to achieve over the last four or five months. A massive change in the value of sterling. And yet it hasn't made a great deal of difference, barring 12 hours of excitement between New Lever and Tesco. We all know the consequences. We all know that the biggest change to our economy over the last two years was that dramatic fall in the price of hydrocarbons. Again, we've absorbed that. And if you take the issue of change generally, just to give you a historic context to those who are younger, after the last war, we had 600,000 people working in deep coal mines. All those jobs have gone. We had 300,000 in town gas, coke plants, gone. 250,000 in electric mechanical telephone exchanges, gone. We had one school leaver in 12 going on to higher education. It's now 50%. We've had 6 million jobs for typists disappear in the last 20 years, gone. If you take Worthing, or Worthing district, We've had about 10 employers of about 1,000 people disappear in the 90 years that Tim and I have represented you in Parliament. And yet unemployment here is still lower than it was before we came. So within all these changes, the effect of us leaving the European Union is going to be significant, but not the dominant issue on prosperity, opportunity, and ups and downs of business cycle. And I think I'd probably end by saying that it's the confidence which matters most. We can work our way into saying some uncertainty means we stop investing, we stop the entrepreneur, we stop change. Or we can say the uncertainties over Europe can't end up being that great because it's in the interest of all the Europeans and us to try to have this cooperation and ways of trading without having too much bureaucracy. And if you want to know why that matters, look for the submission of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. I'm not going to repeat what's in that thing, but if you look at the integration of the motor industry across Europe and across the world, we ought to be able to import things as easily between European countries as we do between the United States and this country, or China and this country. So if I was you, I would stay relaxed but interested and look on this as an important issue, but probably only about 10% of the things we're facing during the next two or three years. Right, morning, everybody. Can I, before we start, can I just reiterate the importance of this 1870 achievement um, subject? There have been so many um, rumours and misinformation going around that we're going to have a six lane highway with 70 miles per hour speed limit and uh, 300 pounds is not done. And it's all my fault. So it would be really good if you can come along and uh, hear all this action likely to uh, happen um, today. Um, as Peter said, what a lot has happened in the last five months since we were here for the up the road with the um, debate we had um, then. Interestingly, I didn't expect it, the, the vote at the Chamber event was evenly split between those who favoured Brexit and those who favoured of uh, Remain. So you were pretty reflective of the uh, country as a whole in the final, uh, in the final result. Um, but I mean, the entire political landscape has changed hugely. I think the best synopsis of it was that cartoon of the Telegraph, where it said there's a new uh, British political um, curriculum for the university students of politics in time from June the 23rd to last night. And so it was moving so quickly at that, uh, that stage. Um, I don't, as Peter doesn't, as probably most of the people in Parliament do not have the definitive answers at the uh, moment. It is going to be a very bumpy 
ride for the next months and years, so I don't think it will take as long as some people seem to um, anticipate. Absolutely, I appreciate that the uncertainty that there has been and will continue to be to some extent is not good for um, business, but we're going to have to um, accommodate that for the civil future. So I think it was helpful when Chris May at least put a, uh, a timeline on triggering uh, Article um, 50 by no later than March of next year, so that we will leave the uh, EU effectively by um, Easter of 2019, and it could be um, before that. And I think, despite listening to the radio to some of the comments made by some of those who did some last um, last night, I think they are getting uh, the message, which whatever way you you voted or you think, there is not going to be another referendum. Uh, we are going to leave um, the European Union and we now have to plan for that and make the most of it get the best possible um, deal. All these shenanigans in Parliament, um, Peter will probably say differently about you should get the vote in Parliament or, uh, or not. Um, the result must be the same. You cannot go against a very clear will of the people in the referendum. It would make a mockery of the whole thing. So therefore the Brexit process must be um, tricky, but we can have a discussion about that, but the result wasn't um, altered. Um, I think what's useful for us, and again I'm sure you'll come up with your own local experiences this morning of how Brexit has already impacted and may impact, and what your main considerations um, actually are. I mean, interestingly, this morning the news that we've got one of the largest British takeovers of an American um, company, despite the current circumstances, and the head of the Frankfurt Chamber, I think it was, talking about the future of European firms in the city, made it absolutely categorically clear it is not in anybody's interest in the EU to weaken the position of the city of London. So all these scare stories about a mass departure from the city of London is absolute nonsense. I'm happy to go into detail about um, why the city is in a very robust situation. If it were to run the future of the, the city of London. It won't be Frankfurt or Paris or any other European capital benefiting from it. The city of London is the number one capital in uh, the world. It has been for several years now. Frankfurt is the next closest and ranks at 18. Uh, Paris is, I think, 35th. If we lose business in that financial services market in the city of London, it doesn't go to Paris or Frankfurt, it goes to Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, or New York. Those are the alternatives, and that takes business further away from um, Europe. I just wondered for the for the gloom markets, obviously they're having a number of problems, but given that we were promised World War Three, the Marshall's landing and the play for all our houses, just worth noting what has happened in the last couple of months. But the GDP figures to the end of uh, uh, June, anticipating uh, Brexit, uh, were actually up more than seven percent above. Uh, the OECD, which warned that of course the economy was going to go backwards immediately from Brexit vote, have now raised their forecast of GDP growth in the UK to 1.8. Uh, <coughs> the first time since the referendum, now more than half, 53% of decision makers felt positive about voting firms of course for the next year. Consumer spending was up 2.4%. Consumer confidence index had jumped 6 points in the biggest monthly rise for um, years. Retail sales are up 6.2% in um, August. Chinese travel to Europe is up 30 cent, etc. etc. So there are a number of things that are happening. We'll give a quote back to the Some things that are um, not as uh, beneficial. But the whole point is new opportunities are coming up for what has, has happened. And the focus has almost entirely been on the exchange rate and the falls in the power that's now for exporters, obviously, that uh, benefits for uh, importers, uh, there are uh, challenges, and for people uh, traveling, there are challenges as well. However, if you talk to people in the money markets, it is not entirely down to Brexit. One reason for pressure on the climate change is the fact that the government had effectively abandoned some of our uh, borrowing uh, targets and um, uh, set the Budget back into uh, balance beyond 2020, that had a big impact on the pound. And actually, the currency that is most overvalued at the moment is the euro. And the problems in Europe 
Like by no means gone away. The, the Greece uh, economy is still in a dark state, it's going to be uh, soon reports on uh, loans. Portugal, to the other Mediterranean uh, economies, has still got some very serious problems, and the political upheaval, which would no doubt ensue the French and German elections if they don't go according to plan uh, next year, will put a lot of pressure on the uh, Europe. So it's not a one way street. But in terms of confidence, I, I was in with Seth Lindjoe in Washington and in Mexico um, just a few weeks ago. And wherever you go, what's really interesting is people coming up to you, treating you as a trade delegation, wanting to talk about how we can expand um, trade um, opportunities. If you take a country like Mexico, Mexico is the number one foreign business hit list. Mexico is a G20 country, it's the 50th largest economy uh, in the world. The trade we do with it is tiny. And the opportunities are huge, and they are really key to do more trade with us. And yet we have a trade agreement between the EU uh, and Mexico, which has not benefited us um, at all. So we very quickly got the Regency in Mexico City to send out some English sample wine from um, Sussex to some of the people that we uh, saw, and various ministers are coming over to uh, London to talk about uh, trade possibilities. We vote with Mexico, the United Nations, more than any other country. We have a huge amount in common. We are now taking advantage of those sorts of situations. They are one of 28 countries which are so far not on the door to say when we can start talking about possible trade deals. So things will change, but there are lots of opportunities that will come out of Brexit. And I think just to finish, there is a hang up on the single market. And the single market and European trade is important, but by 2025, uh, British exports to the uh, and share of trade with Europe will be down to 35%. Uh, it's been declining for some years now. Over the last decade, British exporting goods to the EU has actually fallen by more than 18%. Um, cent. Now, the single market is important, but it's not always cracked up to be. Some 71% of the European economy is in financial services. Only 3.5% of that is intra-country within the EU. So the single market that was set up in the 1980s, particularly in services, is far from mature. And if you are in financial services, for example, there are various alternatives to the single market. We hear so much about passports, but there's equivalents, there's bespoke agreements, there's local arrangements. Less than 20% of the city of London's business relies on Europe. But if anybody has got a problem by us being outside of Brexit, it is foreign banks from Europe who are headquartered in London and are now covered by UK regulators rather than their own regulations. And most EU regulation of financial services originated from the UK. So this is by no means a one-way street, and there is a substantial mutual interest in us uh, preserving and promoting the City of London and the Financial Services Centre that is the UK, for um, example. So there's going to be, as I say, a bumpy ride Years. I don't know whether it's soft Brexit, whether it's hard Brexit, whether it's shaped all about Brexit, I think it's all fairly, uh, fairly meaningless. And it will not be a doorway, although it will be a Swiss model, you said there were six uh, different models, I think it's probably 166 uh, different models, because this is the first time this has happened. And I think we will see things uh, such as uh, special passporting arrangements in specific areas, particularly within financial services, I think we will see specific working views and permits for all sorts of um, different, uh, different disciplines and professions uh, as well. So we just want to make sure that everybody absolutely realises this is going to happen. But when we start the Brexit negotiation process from March or whatever it is, we've got the right people and the right agenda uh, in place, and we get the right um, negotiation. But at the end of the day, just as it was before we voted, it is in nobody's interest if the European economy goes down the pan, and it's not in their interest to 
if the UK economy suffers as well. We remain the largest single market for um, European exporters, by far the largest single market for German car manufacturers exporting to the uh, UK, etc., etc. But there's a big, wide world out there where the trading opportunities that could have happened haven't happened because we haven't had a seat at WTO we be part of the European Union where their record in negotiating trade agreements is not good. You mentioned Canada earlier, the Canadian trade agreement with the uh, EU has been going for nine years now, not actually been signed, because now it's been underlined by the Walloon Parliament uh, in Belgium. The Indian trade agreement spent 10 years, um, didn't, uh, didn't happen. Um, we could lose our own. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got some uh, questions from the court. Cities to go and work in the fields, I've been twice. That was a long time ago. 
producing stuff that we buy. But regardless of what happened on June 23rd, your firm, I'm sure, is talking to those sorts of economists. I'm sure you've got negotiations going on with Mexico. Um, in the defence industry, in which you are partly concerned as well, over 20% of all defence spending in the whole of the EU is in the uh, UK. We are leaders in that sort of area. Now, what is going to happen is there will be shadow trade negotiations going on with a whole series of uh, countries over the next couple of years. We cannot legally sign a trade deal until one minute past midnight after Brexit becomes effective in two years or however long it takes. But I have no doubt that we will have a whole lot of trade deals on the uh, ready to go um, list that we can sign straight on when we come out of the EU. But let's just remember, nothing changes on the day we come out of the EU in terms of where we are now. All EU regulations are still UK regulations. All EU laws are all in shrines in UK law uh, anyway. So we don't suddenly have to change the size of the widgets which you are trading. We want to change those laws and change those regulations because actually we find that there's a much bigger market and the way the widget market is going is the way they're doing it in the US or Japan or whatever. That is then up to us to change uh, the way we, we do things. But we are in a very advantageous position so that we comply with all the EU regulations and laws that are to comply with. And uniquely for EU countries, we actually abide by those rules um, as well. And that's the basis of which we start. Uh, you're right, the one problem we do have is because we've not had to have any trade deals for the last 43 years ourselves. We lack a whole generation of experience um, trade negotiators. We've even offered a team of them by New Zealand. Um, I know they need to do trade with us, but desperately now we're scrapping out and recruiting all sorts of people. And that group is happening um, in Whitehall. It's going to take some time. And that's why I absolutely resisted people say, why are we not triggering Article 50 now? Why are we not just sort of getting on with it? Well, we need to make sure, I'm sure we have all our ducks in a row, but people capable and able to do those uh, negotiations. And we know what we want to negotiate for, and we've got the agenda in front of us when, I get the time to trigger Article 50, and then we sit down with our European counterparts and start talking um, Article and nothing's going to happen. I work for St. George's School of English at a local memory school. Uh, we have been running for 16 years, and for 16 years we brought over 5,000 students to this country. Between myself and four other organisers in Worthy, we bring over 25,000 students here every year, which, just for our school, results over a million pounds paid to local host families and local tradesmen for pocket money that is spent and local host families paying for accommodation our students and looking after them. What I would like to know is, um, being in this trade for 16 years, I have seen a change in 2008 and 2009 when the visa situation changed. It has cost lots of schools going bankrupt because it became very strict and people, it deterred people from traveling to we, as a school at that time, <coughs> decided to go the EU way because obviously EU had no restriction on travel. Now we are putting restriction on EU travel. Now, in 2008 and 2009, many school, schools went bankrupt and there was a great loss of um, tourism. Now we have already seen since June a great loss of tourism. Last year we had 5,200 students. This year we had 1,900. You can do the math, I can do the math. Where are we heading with this? Are we going to make it more difficult or are we going to make it easier? You mentioned that this actually opens opportunities to bring people in from other countries which are outside the EU. It's a brilliant concept, but I have come to this country on a visa. I know what it entails and I know it's not easy and you will make it more difficult. So what I would like to know, what are, what are <coughs> and how are you going to make it easy for people to still want to come to England? Because right now, they don't. Right. 
I did this first hand, so I had a lot of trouble with my youngest daughter, who's just started studying Spanish and Portuguese at a university, who the day after the referendum result, and I was able to my hand the U.S. Um, told me that her great ambition was to become a translator of the European Parliament, and I now wrecked her career opportunities like <laughs> OTB. Um, the foreign language school market is a really important market, and you, you rightly say it brings a lot of money into both the economies, and particularly South Coast, which is traditionally where there's a lot of that, you want that to continue. I would say what happened back in 2008 and 2009 was, I'm afraid, more about focus use of schools and colleges of uh, students coming over um, here who were not invited there to stay in many um, big, which is why a lot of colleges, not about language schools specifically, lost their um, licenses and the viewers still, uh, still doing that. But look, if we're talking about students coming over here for a fixed term to study English as a, um, a foreign um, language, there's no reason why that should not continue. Movement of European citizens on a temporary basis into the UK and hopefully uh, vice versa should remain um, unchanged. It's if you're coming here to live and work is when the requirements will be subject to new visa um, regulations. So we will need to adapt to accommodate those people coming over on short-term courses for uh, English and language. When we spoke earlier, you raised uh, another point you alluded to it there, is the perceptions of whether we want to have those people coming here. Yeah. And, I, and I absolutely agree with you. I think some of the language that has been used at times in various quarters is not helpful. And so we've got a job of work to say just because we are leaving the EU does not mean we are leaving Europe, does not make us any less European or any less welcome to people who we want to continue to come to Europe. We want our people to continue to go travel and study in that. <coughs> that doesn't change, but I agree the language I think uh, needs to be moderated because the end of the day, as I said earlier, the financial reasons or whatever, it's in nobody's interest if barriers go up, uh, go up and um, our economies are at loggerheads rather than mutually uh, complementary. And that's got to be the same as welcoming people uh, still into this, uh, into this country. Hi, it's John Mamma. I'm quite interested actually if you were told that one of the opportunities in Mexico where there's going to be absolutely a large amount of people in the United States, which is no main training organisation, but the outcome of where the election is, there's a large amount of people in America which are going to be voting to build a wall that's going to Mexico and the USA, I don't know. It seems to be clear that the facts that we've given in the line to the Brexit vote were actually factually incorrect on all sides, it doesn't matter which side we're in or out. Um, we will also be facing rising prices at the £40, and of course that increases the cost of us trying to travel to the European countries, specifically, to try and do business with them. If all this was a forecast, then why weren't the public actually made aware of all this when we voted? Because we don't think, in fairness, we were. So we can we actually expect this to stabilise? Because the stabilisation is going to happen um, after Brexit occurs, how long after Brexit are we going to have a stable situation? I don't think I'll have to go back to what was said during the campaign. Secondly, by mentioning the wall, Trump's wall between Mexico and the United States, we actually raised indirectly, perhaps one of the most important trends, which is are we going to go back to protectionism? Or are we going to know the benefits of open trade with few barriers? The TTIP would be sensible, but now both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton seem to be against it. The Europeans seem to be swung by this ghastly group called 38 Degrees, why do we love the rest countries saying, in effect, keep everything to ourselves and don't have free bird trade? They must have gotten the first week their economics were college or university. Open trade, not untrammeled, but open trade is good for everybody. It's good for the poorest, it's good for the better off, it's good for the well off countries. I don't think, I'm going to pursue your question about the actual cost of travel to 
to go to the opportunities of mass cost of travel now is dramatically less than it was in those in exporting those market driven local engineering companies back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. the, the word is how you move your goods from one exhibition to another in different countries, what the cost of travel was, and all the rest. I think I'll, I'll take your, your point is really saying can we try to have low barriers and ease of getting around? And the answer is that would be everyone's ambition, except for those who are playing to audiences who are those extreme supporters in their own towns. I think we actually gain by having change. And we have to realise there are ups and downs as well. And for example, when again when Tim and I became the candidates in the NBC era, we had 1,200 people in the second most advanced car design plants in the world. And when they went, not a single one of those people was short out of work for a day because the skills were high. If you go to Ricardo, you're going to see people trained in Northbrook uh, producing engines that Ron then does not used to know were made in, in Shore. He always thinks everything was made in Wokeham. <laughs> if you go to uh, future energy, <coughs> energy generation, and energy storage, if we meet the global Apollo challenge by Martin Rees and other great scientists, how you can have electricity with carbon free sources at a lower cost than electricity with coal by 2025. The storage comes in, the five or six methods of storing electricity, whether it's massive hydro pumps or it's batteries behind the meter domestically, are going to produce a change dramatically greater than any of the possible consequences of the vote for Britain to leave the European Union. Leave the European Union will matter, not that in some instances, but they're getting small compared with all the other changes that are happening. And I, I could go on about the people from Mexico quite possibly, Brazil will settle down at some stage, Venezuela will recover from their Corbynist uh, approach to economics and social policy. But the biggest difference is going to be the Philippines, Indonesia, China, the Indian subcontinent, and the like. So I think you know, there will be ups and downs. Part of the storm we create ourselves, but most of the natural things have changed. And so our flexibility, adaptability, and common sense which matter most. Let me put up on your point about Mexico. Um, and the whole nonsense with Trump and the, uh, and, and the war. Currently, there is a net, net migration of Mexicans from the US into Mexico. So, all this stuff about what we have a war to keep up the Mexicans. You didn't want to be in the Mexicans because it's actually going the other way. And a lot of major US corporates are investing in Chihuahua products, which is the largest state in uh, Mexico across the border from uh, Texas. Uh, Texas. Um, and that's where all the investment uh, is. So a lot of Mexicans have even more reason to want to get back to Mexico because the economy is growing far more than it is in the, uh, the US. So people actually trying to get into the uh, US are. Jerusalem, and some of the world, the vastly case countries there coming through um, Mexico. So the war is a complete and utter um, nonsense. But it's created a huge amount of resentment in um, Mexico. If you go to the Mexican Parliament, and there are lots of places that say the equivalent of get stuff or Trump or whatever. Um, who's going to benefit from, from that? Whether Trump wins or not, maybe wait. But um, well, it's not going to be the US. The Mexicans are desperately looking for other friends and allies that they can turn to and do trade with. So because Trump has done huge damage to the relationship with, with Mexico, and we have to be in the frame. And there's a lot we can do. Now, they are part of the uh, Trans Pacific Trade Partnership, those 11 nations stretching from the US to New Zealand to Japan. We can do arrangements with them. That's a third of the world's output within that trade partnership. And that's why I, I just resent that everyone talks about the single market that is Europe, as if it's the be-all and end-all. It is a declining, a shrinking, a failing market that in its more than 30 years' existence has failed to bring about a single market in services and trades across Europe. There are still 800 trades in Europe, despite the directives of the 1980s, that are still regulated. I think from photographers to chamber makes so much for the single market uh, in Europe. We got to look further um, afield. Now, in terms of who promised what, 
what we're going to do. So I thought this little booklet that you and I had to pay for, which went through everybody's um, door. So let's start analysing some of the things that didn't happen in that. Where was the emergency budget we were going to have to have within days of us voting for Brexit? Where is the £4,350 bill that it's going to cost every household? Where is the hit on everybody's pensions? Well, actually, the stock market went to a new record high recently, and everybody's pensions, if you're investing in equities, are doing really rather well at the, at the moment. But let's put aside all that nonsense. Let's put aside everybody's, for a month or so, straight on the major hysteria about what had just happened. And let's just focus on what we know is going to happen. We know when it's going to happen by the latest date. And we need to make the most of it. And as we've all said, as we said before or after, it was never going to be an easy road. When you've been in a relationship for 43 years and you extricate yourself from that uh, marriage or whatever, the argument over the CD collection who gets the dog is going to be a fierce and technical uh, one. Just think of how complicated it is with many seven other uh, countries, but we're going to do it. Gentlemen, um, Ian Gardner from Court of Davis Insurance Brokers. Uh, my question really is an uh, industry specific one for us. Um, some of the worries of the, the short to medium term impact is that some of the EU based insurers will drop out of the market and a lot of the major insurers, their investment values will go down, which will lead to a rise in insurance premiums. And over the last year, we've seen two rises in insurance premium tax, first to 9.5% and then to 10%. Which, if the fund is then coupled with the expected increase or, or worried increase in premiums, can we be assured that there won't be any further plans to increase insurance premiums? That's which creates almost a double money in really. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from the premium side of the AT. Okay. A lot of these external taxes are substitutions to bring in the AT on the Mark is a good thing, so it's a bad thing, but that's in effect what I can tell companies can say as well. I tend to think. Uh, the, the, the two, two things that really matter so um, people who pay for insurance. One is the capacity in the insurance market, because if you get over capacity, the rates come down to below income levels and customer gains in the short term. And secondly, what are the costs within the market? And given that a lot of people who are actually paying premiums have got uh, commissions of 20, 30, 40, 50 percent, the actual insurance premium tax is not the biggest thing, it's the difference between what they pay and the value of what they get. So I think I look in the mirror as well as I look the window. Can I just add, I think things right off on that, but then it would be up to us to determine uh, what VAT is applied to. We have the Notorious Civil Tax on Tax as well, which was a nonsense that we were having to impose VAT on that, whether we wanted to or not. We didn't want to because of the EU directive. But talk about the insurance uh, market, which we got changed, uh, which well, we haven't actually got to change. We thought we got changed. It's still not actually the agreement, so the government is that effectively only subsidised for the at the moment. But on all, all the financial services um, markets, um, there's no real single market for insurance in the uh, EU. It's one area where it never really um, happened. And up to something like 87, 88 percent um, of insurers operating um, across the EU do so via subsidiaries rather than branches, and then they rely on passports, which is a big thing we've heard about um, passports. And so anybody can set up a subsidiary a small office with a badge on the uh, on the front. And if you take employees of the London market, the biggest insurance market, less than three percent of their business relies on um, passporting. So the effects of Brexit on the insurance industry are probably the least within the financial services uh, industry uh, anyway. So I mean you're less vulnerable. So we're more important that we control the tax treatment of the of it. And if there are any industries who are going to suffer disproportionately, then that's what our tax system is there to try and work out those uh, balances. So, 
when you cast it from that ETI into the very personal thing, but I wonder if anyone can see a similarity between these discussions and the age of seven, where so many, so many people wanted to get their fingers in the pot. I was surprised at Andrew's question, uh, who should we negotiate with first? Should we negotiate with China and upset India? Should we negotiate with New Zealand and upset Australia? One of the problems we've had in the past is the fact that why it's taken eight years and still not achieved in Canada, is that they're dealing with a committee and not just a, a single entity. Uh, I'm sure that we can negotiate trade agreements uh, much, uh, much speedier than Europe. <coughs> right, I'm trying to turn this into a question. It's very good to see. Do the members of the House believe that by voting on negotiation terms before negotiation starts, do they believe that that is the best way forward? Or is it not um, telling you that you must bid three diamonds before you bid your two cards? Hmm. Um, in, in almost reverse order, I think we would say that we want to have open trade at safe standards around the world. And we can say to China and to India, we'd like to do the same deal with each of you. With New Zealand and Australia, we'd like to do the same deal with each of you. We'd like to have trade with other countries as easy as it is with the other present members of the European Union and the EFTA countries. Except for occasional protectionism. And you could argue sometimes whether bringing in steel that's being subsidized by other people is a good thing for us or a bad thing. If someone was telling us grapes at subsidised price, you might say it's very good for us. Because we don't grow that many, we grow do for wine, but not for table grapes. Uh, so I, I don't see any difficulty in actually declaring our hand what our objectives are, which is that we can increase the prosperity, stability, cooperation around the world by having virtually no barriers that aren't justified on grounds of health. Or safety standards. The comparison with the A27, I think, has, has an interesting thing. By the way, if any of you can write to the Worthing Herald during the next four or five days, saying that they look forward to the meeting on Friday, the today meeting, and sure that people will gain most by having a safer A27 for the 300 residents who have to come onto the A27 two or three times a day, and that if you want to have Worthing being a place which has business as well as tourism, as well as retired people, you've got to try to make sure that using the 887 is better than using the 8259, or better than using the coast road, or the local rat runs. If you want to have staff and students at our colleges getting there on time, whether by walking, or by bike, or by car, or by bus, you actually have a road which moves, stops obviously when you need to, traffic lights and the like, but it just works. And you avoid the jams which Bad environment, bad health. Just get a few letters in and say that a bit of balance in the discussion matters. Uh, we hear a lot of things about Europe which um, may be justified if you look for an extreme comment. But for example, when Tim was waiting in the pamphlet around produced by the government, the only actual prediction is this if the UK voted to leave the EU, the result of economic shock put pressure on the value of the pound to risk higher prices to some household goods. Well, that's not actually has happened. It's the only prediction I've found in the whole evening, so the rest was something else. <laughs> 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 it's told that it hasn't been really needed for now. <laughs> so I think actually that there is something to be said for, for trying to get the realities there. Uh, we can get the H7 moving forward if people will realise it is never ever going to go through the downs. It wouldn't have done in the 1990s, the inspector said so. Doesn't the traffic job not cost effective, environmentally unacceptable. Those are true in spades now. So the question is what improvements can we get to make life better for us, and by the way, for those trying to not interfere with us. You've got to get balance, you've got to get participation, and you've got to be frank with people, which is what I plan to do next Friday, just as much as today. <coughs> well, we're going to introduce each other in this, but there's a little table here which suggests that we can't be there's 165,000 jobs at risk in the transport industry, 
uh, really enjoyed the Bridge of the Mighty and, and Telecom. Well, that was the one you promised the NHS. That's that was that was never actually said that three hundred and fifty million pounds would go directly to the NHS. The figure, the figure I know you do, the figure we do is a net cost of ten point six billion pounds, which we pay to the EU every year, and it will be up to us as to how we spend that ten point six billion pounds. If the voters want the government to spend all of that will be uh, EU and none of buying access to the single market, which we may have in certain areas, for example, then that's entirely a matter for us. Um, two points that uh, David's um, uh, raised. Let's remember that um, the single market, the EU, is a customs union. It's a protectionist bloc. Now, I am against protectionism, and I want to see us having open trade agreements with as many nations across the globe as possible. That may be necessary in some cases that certain things should be subject to tariffs to prevent swapping certain industries which are vulnerable um, here. But by and large, we should be looking to have open trade uh, agreements. What having a protectionist block with the EU means at the moment, to give one small example, is if you are a poor farmer in Ethiopia producing coffee, which is a staple of that country's export, the fourth poorest country in the world, one of the biggest recipients of aid for this country, quite rightly, and if you export it to the EU, you will have a 30% tariff slap on it straight away. Is that right? <coughs> Does it make sense that your taxpayer's money and mine is going into an international aid? Budget, which is 0.7% of our economy, what I have to think uh, is right, to help agriculture and help trade farmers in a country only for us then to slap a 30% tariff on them when they export their goods to us. That's the nonsense that is part of the, uh, of the EU. And you're right, this whole Canada deal now is a case in point. On some technicalities, <laughs> I can't remember what it is, the Walloon Parliament. The Belgian National uh, Parliament has vetoed it um, effectively. And that is why the EU has got trade agreements with countries whose total economies add up to $7 trillion. The country of Peru alone has trade agreements with countries whose GDP add up to $56 trillion. And that's the EU, with all the single market advantages, with all the brains in Brussels just has not managed to pull off those trading uh, agreements. And it just won't happen. So for goodness sake, can we get on with it and do it um, ourselves? On the second question, which I think we're leading to, is about Parliament's role in all of this. Let's be absolutely clear. On a few rare occasions, it started by Harry Wilson, Parliament gives over its power to make a decision on an important matter to people. That's what a referendum is all about. We don't use that power lightly. We don't do what they do in Switzerland and have a referendum on what time dogs should be um, indoors and things like that. It's on highly weighty matters. Parliament voted by a large majority to give the power of decision over our future membership of the EU to the citizens of this country. And more people voted on that decision than have ever voted any electoral situation in this country in our history. So that absolutely makes it clear that we are going to leave the uh, EU and that we must trigger Article 50, which starts to bring about that process. All those saying, oh, it's outrageous, Parliament must have a vote on this, are purely people who are trying to frustrate the very clear instruction which we've been given by the electorate in this country, whether you like it. Or not. And more people turned out to vote in that referendum than turned out in the last general election to elect Peter and the 648 um, other MPs. Now, when it comes to the terms on which we actually leave, and there may be options, we may have certain cocktails of possibilities that we may be offered, that we may have some form of 
um, deal with the uh, single market, but it may involve some sort of visa quotas on certain areas. I don't know. There are various different permutations. Now, hopefully, the government can get to a stage where it comes up with the best possible deal, and it thinks that's as good as it's going to get to be okay uh, with that, or it may come back with various options. At that point, Parliament absolutely has a role in all this for us to debate and ultimately for us to vote on which we think is the best option going forward. But it will be the best option that achieves us coming out of Europe rather than possibly frustrates, delays, or undermines us coming out of Europe. And that all this nonsense by all these angry people on the way and saying that's a disgraceful infringement of parliamentary democracy that we're not going to get a vote on it. We had a vote, but we opted to give the final vote to you. Okay, we've been closing 10 minutes now in the morning. I know Andrew's got one more question. I just wonder if there are any more questions for the floor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Closer to about these, given that government debt exceeds 1.6 trillion, the budget deficit is adding that government debt of 60 billion per annum. Uh, the trade deficit is at 6%. The inflation is expected to rise to 3.2% by the end of next year. Are we not, Mr. Khan, set fire to the exit flow subject to the kinds of strangers? And in that context, what real sovereignty? So much we've got to make our own messes, we've got to try and clear them up as well. It's a month of life like that. There's never going to be a day when front page newspaper is blank, saying that there is some case in the government or parliament.
Shinoza that uh, may have not proved to come uh, to fruition on that either. So I would be very careful with the situation of those sorts of figures anyway. And of course, what happened after the election, uh, after the referendum, um, interest rates went up. Yeah, but he had Like the OECD that predicted that the GDP was going to fall after the referendum, they now have to predict that. Great plan. 
contact cooperation with our student institutes, that relies on so university cooperation and EU funding. You have moved on to that yet. And we did, I mean, the government has said that it's going to uh, underwrite academic um, uh, programs as well as agricultural um, subsidies, at least until uh, 2020. Again, the world of academia and, and students, there's this great myth that um, all this money goes into student exchanges and things like that. Um, it does, but actually, if you are a citizen of Turkey or Norway and a lot of other countries, you also get the Erasmus program um, money and opportunities um, to. Why should we be any different to that? It's also talking about the funding streams that come through to business, education, and infrastructure. Sure. Newcastle opted out of the EU and they, their infrastructure is, has all been through EU funding or a lot of it. Yes, but I gave the other day to Friday, I gave the, um, the figures for the region, EU regional infrastructure uh, funds, but we pay the equivalent of £5 billion and we get back the equivalent of £3 billion, very, uh, very roughly. Uh, that's a two billion pound uh, difference, so we can decide where it goes, work on the roads and the infrastructure, rather than what the EU is going to give us. We were major, major net disbeneficiaries of EU regional funding. We made contributions to your poor ourselves, and some to rich in ourselves. Yeah, I've been uh, continuing that line in two or three bits. Um, the Charles First Guarantee for us in 2020 funds for those programs that have been bid until we were sustained. Horizon 2020 is a program that goes out to 2020 and there will be future rounds of that which essentially UK companies will be cut out of in practical emotional terms because our European partners don't know what the arrangement is going to be post-2020. Um, that is happening now. I have colleagues experiencing that. And then we have Framework 9, which is what will follow on from Horizon 2020. What is the government going to do to provide an equivalent to that and enable us to contribute with that? Those programmes have very, very long lead times. Those are being talked about now. My colleagues are struggling to be... My European colleagues want us around the table, but they don't know the mechanics for engaging us when we are able to do something else. And the government needs to put its finger out and give us some very strong messages now. What's the plan? The plan or recommendation is if you put that to Tim, copy to me, we can put it to ministers, and once it gets on the table, more often they open the file, more often they'll try to say, you'd have advanced agreement on these kinds of things rather than waiting two or three years. We've already been doing that for this. Well, co copy, copy to Tim as well, copy to me, please. I'll get the briefing now. The SNMT is doing very well on some of these things, my view. Okay, I think we just about done. It just remains for me to thank our questions. Whatever your views on the future of this morning, I think the range of questions are outstanding and responses equally outstanding and very full, very frank, very honest, and a lot of common sense is coming across it. That's reflected in the rest of the world that we may actually come out. Never done this. Okay, so we can leave only way we can Thank you. Have a really great day. Thank you. Thank you.